see, and it's far from black and white. Here we are, it's episode 17 of Stu's Wrestling Podcast. This week, I've got the patriarch of the famous Knight family, Mr. Ricky Knight Sr. on the line. We talk about how he got his start in the business, the styles of wrestling he likes, what styles he doesn't like. We also talk about the film Fight My Family that did so well at the box office and has pulled in big numbers on Netflix in more recent times. It was a pleasure to get Ricky on. We talk about the family. We talk about his promotion war, World Association of Wrestling. We get through quite a lot of topics this week, so it was a joy to get him on. So here we are, episode 17, with the patriarch of the world-famous wrestling family, Ricky Knight Sr. Thank you very much and enjoy. Hello and a warm welcome to my guest for today's episode of Shoes Wrestling Podcast. It is the patriarch of the world-famous Knight family and especially famous in the UK, Mr. Ricky Knight. How's it going, Ricky? I'm good, Stu. How are you, buddy? Fantastic, mate. Fantastic. Uh, absolute, I, I'll keep saying this, absolute pleasure to have, have you on. I'm a massive wrestling fan and I've watched all your stuff with the family for many, many years. So it's just an absolute I've just made it beyond words, mate. Beyond words, what I, what I could say. Uh, my pleasure, buddy. Uh, let's, let's, let's get this out there and uh, have a good chat. See what's going on, yeah? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Now, Ricky, when did you first start watching wrestling? I always open with this question with the guests. Right, let me think. Cause it's, uh, that would be when I was oh, very young man. I was going my big brother to Potter's Bar. Uh, years ago in Evelyn uh, I was living in London, Camp Union. My brother used to take me, as I said, it's a uh, long, long time ago. Jackie Palo and all them sort of people. And uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, what, what, must be 50 years ago now. I first started watching it, maybe even more. How did, how did you get your start in the business? How did that come about? Well, what it was, I used to, uh, run, I used to run doors all over the country. I used to be, uh, uh, what do you call it, an agency for Dorman. And uh, I used to run a place in King's Lane called Champs Nightclub, which was uh, a very tough place. It was like down at Beirut every Saturday night. It was a real tough, tough place. And uh, we're very, very uh, uh, strict and over that in. Well, it's one particular night. I was at the head of the door, which was my job. And all these guys come up, and these cauliflower ears and black noses. Wanted to come in, come in, and I was very dubious about it. But then they said they were wrestlers, and they'd been uh, wrestling at the King King Court Exchange. So I thought, well, these are fighting men for a living, and because that's no great, so I let them in. And about two minutes later, I was approached by a guy called Jimmy Ocean, who was uh, wrestling at the time. He was a lightweight up there with uh, Johnny Saint and all them sort of guys. Stevie Gray was part of that pack. And, uh, he made a big line for me, started talking to me and asked me, you know, by the end of the night, he asked me if I'd been doing wrestling and that. And I played football and stuff like that. So I was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a loss to what to do with me. And uh, I said, well, I'll think about it. About two weeks later, I went to about a friend's in Norwich and uh, I he was Jimmy Ocean. He was lodging at this person's place. So uh, sometimes in life, I believe that things are... And as I said, Jimmy said to me, he was just going training at the Norwich Court Exchange, which is run by Brian Dixon, and that he was going down there some training, would I be interested in going? So I said, yeah, I'll just nip home, get some training gear, and I'll meet you down there. This is what we've done. And by the end of the session, Jimmy said, look, mate, you're a bit of a natural. Would you, would you like to come to business and give it a go? So Jimmy then trained me for 18 months, and uh, I, I then take you 18 months later. And with the super up, we were top of the bill as a, as a tag team called the Superflyers. So that's how it all started, really. That was that's a quick turnaround, that, from training to, to you know, fully-fledged wrestler. Well, the thing was, I was pretty lucky, as I said, because, uh, you know, you hear a lot of the old horror stories, when it's like becoming a business and then back. But when I done that, you've got to remember, Jimmy was already established. He was wrestling for the lightweight championship and stuff. So it's pretty good, and... Uh, Brian Dixon was um, very uh, futuristic and he was more ahead of his time and uh, me and Jimmy went out and uh, we brought him into the first bit of the we went out and got all this outrageous gear, dyed the hair blonde, we all, uh, dressed the same everywhere they went, even when we turned up his clothes, we dressed the same so people knew the supervisor in town and knew we were in taxi and everything else and, uh, as I said and uh, 
and 19, was it 1990, we, uh, they put the uh, tag team title on me and Jimmy, and uh, we never expected it. And we, our careers is blossomed from there, you know, we've uh, I've done four or five years on the circuit, then we were tag team champion, and it was a uh, fantastic feeling, because you've got to remember in them days, it's only uh, Brian Dixon and, and the Crabtrees who run in England, and if you were champions then, you're recognised all over the world as the... Uh, British Tag Team Champion, not like today where you got about 200 uh, different promotions and Tag Team Champions, you were recognised all over the world as the uh, British Tag Team Champion, it was the biggest honour that we could ever have bestowed on us by uh, by Brian Dixon, who was the mentor to Super Players. How did, I'm going to jump jump ahead a bit, because you said like 1990, now obviously yeah. you, you had the 25th anniversary of your company, Wrestling Association, no, World Association of Wrestling, sorry. <laughs> So, yeah, actually, yeah. how how did that come to fruition? How did you form it uh, in '94? It all started when we won them titles. You know, it, 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 we got the titles at Bristol Colston Hall. The fans and stuff like that. It was a hot, real hot crowd. And at the end of it, there was no no, no belts. This way, you know what I mean? I was like, yeah, mate, man. You know, we, we just won the biggest prize in British and. Uh, you know, there's no belts where it was going on. So, over the years, we got more frustrated, more frustrated, because of the fact, you know, I was saying, title matches going on first, and this, well, this is not how wrestling went to please, of course. You know, I'm frustrated. I'm going to start my own company, me and Jimmy, and my wife's decided to start her own company. And, uh, you know, because I, I just think promoters lost their way at the time, and, you know, wrestling was having a bad time at the time as it was. I didn't think it was helping much the way it was being structured at that, you know, so just back to Brian or anyone else. I mean, Brian's the most, most successful promoters of all time, but I just felt I could run things different and I wanted to make my own talent and uh, bring up my own, uh, you know, my own stars. That's what I've done ever since. We have a training school to be going as long as we can't be, you know, even longer. We were training people before we even started a company, so that, that's where I wanted to go. Yeah, my wife, and that's what we've done, and uh, we haven't looked back. Who, who was, uh, who was passing through in the early times of the company? Well, like I said, we had people like the UK Pitbulls, and uh, there's a guy called Brixton Broad and Bash, and they all, they all went on the circuit, and they all worked with Brian. You know, in them days there was a structure. They would start off with us doing local shows, and then they, Brian would pick them up for the uh, call exchange in Norwich, and then you have the camp circuit, and then. You know, to be on Brian's roster in them days, it, it was something, you know, it meant everything. You know, to be on Brian Dixon's roster, it was the best roster, you know, in Europe, probably, you know, that was, um, so when our guys actually reached that sort of, uh, that height, we, we knew that we'd done a good job and uh, we got uh, quite a lot out there, you know, and uh, my wife actually came from the academy, you know, Soraya Knight, yeah. she came from the academy, we had uh, people like the girls, Angel, Sheena, Summers, we kept the women's division going when it was shut. There was no women's division in them days. They'd gone. Everybody had gone. And at one stage, there was only three promotions left. I mean, even Brian left. At one stage, so bad the business got. We were going out 30, 40 people every night. It's heartbreaking, but we refused to give up and uh, kept British wrestling alive. And at the time, there was my wife left and a girl called Julie Starr from Bradford. The only two women wrestlers left. All the other girls were retired and gone. There was no faith in the women's scene, so we kept it going. And then we brought in girls like Angel, Sheena, Summers, and we just kept going and going. And uh, so the business picked up again. And uh, that's how it was, you know. We just uh, loved the business so much, we kept going. And that, uh, I know all these new companies try and rewrite history, that they were salvation, but I can guarantee you they were, you know. It wasn't just UK-based promotions struggling at that time, was it? You know, even as, as uh, I remember WWE around that time, they were struggling. Oh, yeah, I mean, the industry in America, you know, WWE was still okay, but I mean, you know, it's just that the industry in America, it's like it was now, I mean, you know, let's go out 15, 20 people on the industry over there, you know, and so like, it was a real bad place, it was a dark place, and we wondered once today if wrestling was actually going to survive, you know, and uh, uh, what happened, uh, the guy was running uh, Scott Conway, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, he's running TWA promotions in them days. And he came up with his massive brainwave of bringing over the Americans. It was his idea in the first place. He brought over Earthquake. But the good thing that Scott done, he brought them over for two weeks. He didn't load the card with the Americans. What he'd done was got Earthquake to pull the uh, crowds in, which he did, sold out everywhere. But he put all the top British talent around it. 
and people were walking away from the shows going, geez, we didn't even know these guys exist, we didn't even know British wrestling was still alive, we didn't know this, these guys are good, you know. So then he brought over the, the Bushwhackers and we'd done the same and sold out everywhere and stuff like that. And it, it, it started to develop the scene again because people started to come back. And then uh, uh, Brian Dixon came back and they started to uh, go for a Scott to use these guys and the scene started to build up again. So uh, I always give credit to Scott Conway because you know, he had a vision at that time, which he'd he done and you know it worked. And uh, I, I credit Scott for everything in them days and business was bad. I mean, it, it, that was really bad at that time. That I, we broke all the mould by 2001, we'd done a super show and we got 2,000 in the night that went against everything that was going about in wrestling that time, you know, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, people try and rewrite history, but I've got to remember, I did put a history, so I know exactly what happened with the wrestling, so, uh, um, when these guys try and, you know, take the, the heat off Scott, that really annoys me, because I put it all down to Scott Conway and his vision at the time. Just like I think, what I take away from what you were saying is don't don't give up as well. Oh no, never give up. You know, it's, uh, you know wrestling's in my blood, and uh, you know that's why even now the British wrestling we teach in our academy. I never, I personally never want to see British wrestling, the art of British wrestling, die. Okay? All our guys are on a traditional British wrestling base. They're trying to do. Obviously, they go out there on the circuit. They might do other stuff. They'll work to the audience what they have to work to. You know, they want the indie, you know, grip rock. My lads can do it as well. But every one of our lads have been based on the American rest. Uh, sorry, on the British style wrestling. So when they, you know, they can put on a British uh, style match any time. The rounds match everything. So uh, that's a tradition. What will never die. We'll go where the W's around because that's our big thing about. We want to keep the art of British wrestling alive. To me, yeah, it's the biggest art form of wrestling out. You have got to remember, in the early days, we had all the guys, all the Japanese guys, come over to learn from us. We had, you know, the Hearts come over and learn from us. All the top Americans come over to learn from the British guys. And all of a sudden, you know, it's a dying art. But as I said to uh, our family, won't have it. We will keep British wrestling alive, and that, that's what we're all about. That's cool, man. The Americans, the Americans uh, love our round system, don't they? Yeah, I'd say if you go any top America, I would not get wrong, we've used top guys who's come over for us, and they love our system, they love our training. I mean, I remember once uh, uh, Scott Hall, you know, Razor Ramon, he said to me he's in America, and he went to watch my wife train, one because my wife did a lot of training abroad, the British style. He nipped in for two minutes, and ended up staying for six hours, he could not believe the stuff that my wife was showing these American guys. And, and they love her all around the world. That's where she makes her money, training people in the American, uh, British style, all around the world. Australia, you know, she's been everywhere uh, teaching this style. And as I said, people like, you know, people like Scott Hall come to you and say, your wife is a, a training genius. You know, you know, she's doing something yeah. right. And she still wrestles, doesn't she? Oh, she still wrestles. Yeah. She's, still over, she's still over the world at once. She's uh, still training all over the world at the moment. But, um, you know, she's, um, I just get very surprised that she's not using the UK more. You know, all her work is abroad. Yeah. And one of the best wrestlers, women wrestlers outside of the uh, WWE, and you don't get uh, work in Britain, which I don't understand. I find it very frustrating. You have to go around the world to show up a talent as a trainer and as a performer. And uh, I just think some of the time that the British guys, you know, from March should wake up and see what they got before it's too late, which is. 48 now, her career's not going to be too much longer. And I think the UK guys should wake up and realise what they've got. In, uh, I don't think they realise what they, how good she is at what she does in the ring and as a trainer. It surprises me, Ricky, that she's, you know, she's not. I, I obviously didn't know that. I thought she was booked, you know, a lot over here. It's just, uh, it's it's very interesting that, you know, yeah, she should have more bookings over here. Absolutely. Oh, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's just amazing me and frustrating me, as I say, because, you know, she can... As I said, she, she is, you know, she has her money, don't get me wrong, she, she does all these uh, signings in America, because they've got to remember outside, outside WWE, WWE, she's one of the biggest indie stars, indie girls out there, and the promoters and the fans love her out there, so I just I don't understand yeah. why this company has not used her. It's, ba- it's baffling, yeah, it's uh, crazy. Cool, cool that she's getting booked over there, but yeah, it'd be nice to... Uh, other on the, the scene over here a bit more, as you say. Um, who's passing through? Who's passing through the promotion at the moment? Who, is there any standout guys for you? Or I'm not saying that you're playing favourites because I'm sure you like all the guys, but 
Any standouts? Well, I'm just saying we got, um, you know, it's a uh, bit of Obviously, we got RKJ, the, you know, on, on the new lad on the block. He will be the next major star. We can like Junior. I'm talking about Roy Sun. He's going to be outstanding. We've got uh, we've got a lad there. He's an untapped talent as well. I mean, uh, Brad Slayer has been about the business for ten years. He's one of the best performers I've seen, and uh, he should be out there more. Brad Slayer is another lad. Alex Young he is absolutely amazing. Alex Young, the young. He should be out there booked a lot more, and we've got so many coming through. We've got PJ, our other grandson. We've got so many, and the girls scene we've got is amazing at the moment. We've got loads of girls coming through. You know, it's just uh, at the moment I think it's one of the best uh, best uh, group of uh, trainees we've had a long time in talent wise. To be honest with you. It's, not, it's cool that the next generation and the family are coming through now as well. I've obviously seen bits of uh, Ricky Knight Jr. Uh, not 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 being to a show at this end, but he's obviously been booked on the shows up here. So hopefully this year I'll get out when when he's booked at this end. Yeah, well, yeah, he's just a natural. You know, when you walk out the curtains, he's going to be a, a star. He's got he's got the aura of a star already, even though he's not there yet. Like, like you can tell when you've got these kids or these young people that they've got this aura, a bit like the daughter Paige had. She had the same aura. You know, she's going to be a star. There's a couple of girls now who have not even trained yet, but I can tell you now they're going to be money in, in, in the bank because they've got this thing about them. Uh, you, you can suss it. And as I said, we've got two or three of them at the moment. I think you've gone to big things, real big things. How, how about your boys as well? What, what are they up to? Well, Zach. Well, Zach's sitting there now because I'm doing it from the office. And, uh, yeah, Zach's, um, he's breaking out a bit. Roy took a hiatus for a little while because he's uh, he's split with his wife and he needs to sort things out. But uh, Zach's done okay. He's just got he's just got a book in in Italy for a training school over there. I mean Zach's another one. He's very gifted. Like his mum for training, he's one of the gifted, most gifted lads I know. And the thing with Zach is he can, he's only 20, 28, 29 now, but he can be one of the lads, but he can still be a boss. You know the lads respect him that much. He can. He can go out and have a drink on Monday, but be the boss next day and, and they'll do, you know, do what they tell them. So, yeah, Zach's so very gifted in that area, and I think he's going to make a living out of that. And uh, since the movie, he's had a couple of movie roles. I think some more are going to come up for him. He's now signed to an agency there. So, uh, yeah, his life's very good at the moment, and uh, everything's looking good for him. Um, um, it, it's, uh, as a fan, it's cool to see. I was, ju- was going to just say about the film... Uh, obviously, fight with my family. Uh, I went. I went to go and watch it on the day of release, and uh, it was absolutely brilliant. Was waiting a long time for it to come out, obviously because we'd heard stuff. But uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, as I said, we were happy with it. You're always a bit worried about how they're going to betray you and everything else, and how they're going to betray the business point of me. I mean, we get ripped. You know, we get stick every day on the internet. So we're not worried about that sort of thing, but. I will worry how they betrayed the business, but I think they betrayed it very well. Uh, they always say, is your family really like that? And we say, well, it was a watered-down version of our family. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's true. I mean, it's, we come across as outrageous, and we probably are, but as we said, as well, watered-down version of our family. Uh, we are more outraged in the film, but as I said, the film, to me, it was uh, a good, it's a bit like Rocky. You don't have to be a wrestling fan to enjoy the film. And lots of people who are not wrestling fans have written to me and said, look, we're not wrestling fans by any means, but we loved the film. It was a great family story and everything else. So that's very pleasing. That, you know, it's, it's, it's a, not just about wrestling. It's everyone's liked it. I, I, I'm not blowing smoke. I, I really enjoyed it. But yeah, so you do you do fine when it's Hollywood. Like you're saying, just going to your point, like watered down. But yeah, I we loved it and the missus isn't a wrestling fan but she came with me and she thoroughly enjoyed it as you were saying you know it polarises wrestling doesn't it well that's, that's a bonus I say because a lot of people have said the same as you I took my girlfriend I took my husband they're not wrestling fans and they come away enjoying it so we've reached a whole new audience and uh, now it's gone out on um, what's it gone out on the second Netflix now it's gone out on Netflix we're getting a second uh, hit from it you know it's gone on Netflix, you get a lot, lot of new people writing to me and said they've seen it on Netflix and uh, it's doing well on there, went to the top 10 first week on Netflix and stuff. So, yeah, it's been very successful and um, we can't be more proud of the movie, to be honest with you, it's been fantastic. I've had, I've had a lot of people messaging me uh, who've got Netflix, who, who stumbled across it and they, they've enjoyed it too. 
And once again, they're non-wrestling people. So, you know, fair play. It was, it was brilliant, brilliant film. Well, no, no, it's on, it was on all the air flights. Eh? When you fly America or anywhere in the world, you can watch all the film. So a lot of the lads who, who travel know nothing about wrestling are watching the film and enjoying it. So, yeah, it's, it's everywhere at the moment. And it's uh, it's good for us because it's, it's, it's uh, drummed up business for us. People now want to uh, uh, be a part of us, want us to uh, put shows there, want us to do interviews and you know, stuff. And uh, it's, uh, it's elevated the Knight family to another level, to be fair, which is really good for us business-wise. Uh, do you get to watch much wrestling? Now, I, obviously, I ask people in the business. Some say they don't really get a chance to watch it because they're like, you know, in the business doing their own thing. Do you do you watch much of the stuff from America? Oh, I'm not a fan of American wrestling whatsoever. Right. Uh, Zach, Zach still watches it, and the uh, not, um, the not family do the, the younger generation. I mean, like, oh, okay, Jay, they watch every Japanese or all, all lot, you know, but. Um, I mean, with me being a promoter and a wrestler and everything else, I live wrestling all week, you know? Yeah, yeah. I live wrestling, so when I go home at night, mm. you know, I'm more into just watching the sport channel, watching the football, watching me on the darts or something. I'm not really into it, you know? It's just, uh, I just, don't get me wrong, in the days of Hulk Hogan and that era, I watched as much as everyone else and I, and I, I loved it. And, uh, uh, at the moment, with this flip flop stuff, it's not for me. I'm not saying it's, it's not right. I'm not saying people don't enjoy it, but I don't enjoy watching it. I like a good old fashioned hard hitting match with storyline and everything else. You know what I mean? So that's that's, that's the sort of wrestling I like. And it's hard to find. I think the nearest you get to it is the NWA at the moment. I think they're doing a great job in what they're doing yeah. at the moment. But that's more that would be if I did watch wrestling, that'd be more the NWA stuff. Probably. Yeah, I I uh, I agree with you. Uh, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying what they're doing. Uh, just like the throwback style. Obviously, I know everyone's saying that, but it's just cool the studio style of it. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's what people. I mean, all these big crowds, there's big uh, stuffs, all right. But when my daughter was in the uh, wrestling in WWE, before she done a neck, obviously we used to go to shows to see her, and it seemed to me that the crowd. You just go absolutely nuts when say the Undertaker come down the aisle or someone come down the aisle. And that was it. Once they're in the ring, I didn't give a, didn't give a shit. You know? <laughs> they're, they're looking for the next one to come down the aisle. And they, they didn't seem to uh, get engrossed in the matches, you know. Like our fans, as soon as we get in that ring, they're engrossed from the start to finish of the match. And uh, they're really old school fans. And they, I, I love that, you know. They still live the, uh, you know, they live the scenarios is what we do. And stuff. I'm not saying, you know, they still believe in it, but what we do, we, we suspend belief for them. So when they go home, you know, I always say, like, a good magician, uh, do a magic trick and make a hotel disappear or a plane disappear. You know it's a trick, but you still walk away and you go, wow, that's fantastic. And that's what we try and do with our fans. We, they all know now what wrestling is, but we still want them to walk away and go, wow, they got me there. That was fantastic, you know. And, but I think with that indie stuff, you just see gymnasts going at it. You know, and it doesn't, to me, it doesn't suspend belief. It doesn't see no storyline. And the biggest thing that's going out of wrestling is sell it. Nobody sells it anymore. You know, I'll take a DDT and jump up like I won, you know, Drake the Snake made that famous for being a finisher. Now people just disregard it and jump up again and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it's really not for me. I'm not criticising people to do it because they're making a very good living out of it. But I still like the old school stuff. Yeah. So, in a nutshell, I don't watch the other, that sort of stuff. Different, different strokes for different folks, Ricky. Exactly, that's what I'm yeah. saying. I was like, my grandsons, obviously, they love all the uh, indie stuff when they watch it, and good, good, good luck to them, you know. As I said, when you're on our show, you have to do a lot of stuff, but we, we, we still like the old fashioned stuff, but they're still making the names in other places, so it doesn't matter. Ricky, thank you, thank you so much for coming on today. I've, I've enjoyed it. I've learned learned some stuff, especially back twenty odd years, thirty years ago. So, uh, just thanks for sparing half an hour coming on. Not, I I, appre- I appreciate. It. I know you're busy with all the stuff going down. All right, buddy, not a problem. Okay, catch you later, buddy. Take care. Thank you very much. Yeah, Bye now, mate. Bye, mate. Cheers. Bye.